Hi folks, welcome to IJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in the first part of week 10 of the Ramish Sunni Bawani Theranos trial. As a reminder, Bawan is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. So what do you guys think about the FDA players? Two, three. Well, that's enough of that for now. Let's get to the trial. Proceedings began in court on Tuesday, that's the 10th of May 2022, and we had a CMS, that's Centres for Medicare and Medicaid Services Inspector, called Sarah Bennett, take the stand. Now, Sarah took part in an inspection of Theranos in September 2015. As an observation, neither she nor her colleague inspector, Gary Yamamoto, took the stand in the Holmes trial. Now I believe that this is a deliberate tactic on behalf of the government to provide some strength to those indictments relating to patients. Holmes was found not guilty on the patient related indictments and in her trial the government used primarily patient testimony to highlight the impact of the Theranos lab practices. As we'll hear, Sarah's testimony does bolster that part of the government's case. Well let's cut straight to the chase. We heard about the multiple lab violations that the CMS inspection found in its report. Now, in terms of her approach to the deficiency, she said, if it's not documented, it's not done. In order to be able to support what is done, they have to be able to provide this documentation, and they did not. Okay, we've covered some aspects of the report already. I think it's best to summarise what was being looked at. I'll show the first page of the CMS report, which was sent to Theranos in January 2016. This was the covering letter for all the details. Now this was about three to four months after the initial field work was undertaken and Theranos were very late in providing some evidence to the CMS inspectors. I think they provided it in late December 2015. Now we can see here very specific conditions that were not met. For example, D50244242CFR493121512. However, rather than look at these in detail, which are pretty damning enough, but would be very dry to go through in detail. I think it suffices to read out the central conclusion on this covering letter on the report in this particular case. Dot, dot, dot. Determined that the deficient practices of the laboratory pose immediate jeopardy to patient health and safety. Dot, dot, dot. Is causing or is likely to cause at any time serious injury or harm or death to individuals served by the laboratory. Now, if that's not bad, I don't know what is. I would have thought Balwani's attorney would want to move on fairly quickly from this, but on cross-examination he went through the CMS report again, re-highlighting the deficiencies, which seemed somewhat counterproductive to his case. He also asked Bennett whether she reviewed the fingerstick lab. Somewhat evasively, Bennett replied, I may have reviewed some of the quality control data and performance specifications. Also, what about the quality control tests and evaluations? If they're not done in a timely manner, the quality control is not really effective. Perhaps a key final question was whether there was any evidence that Balwani was aware that Theranos was non-compliant before the CMS lab deficiency findings. No, she replied. To my mind, this is a double-edged sword because clearly if he didn't know, then making representations to investors and the like would be done out of ignorance, so therefore he couldn't have deliberately lied. On the other hand, if he did know, clearly he wasn't operating very effectively as a COO if he let those practices continue. Or maybe he did and just turned a blind eye to them. Make your own mind up on that one. I can't quite work out where I stand on it. Back on redirect, Leach asked for the prosecution whether it was normal that they interview COOs during the CMS lab inspection. No, not normally, but we did tell Mr Balwani every day what deficiencies we found. Now, no one had pointed out the direct link yet in court, but surely it must come up. If you remember the evidence of Balwani's dermatologist friend, Sunil Dawan, oh sorry, I meant to say lab director employee, well, when was he requested to come in and sign all of those documents as he testified? Yep, in September 2015, the same time as the CMS inspection took place. And when did he do it? At the weekend, I believe. 
when the CMS inspectors wouldn't be there. Anyway, that was just my thought processes tying some of the evidence together. So back to Bennett, she said that in November 2015, Theranos had not notified physicians of deficiencies that CMS identified in its INR blood tests. She thought patients should have been notified right away. Well, too right they should. The defence at this point tried to argue away from the jury that the government shouldn't be asking Bennett how Theranos lab deficiencies impacted patients. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Anyway, the judge said the questioning line could continue. In summary, in this testimony, the government has created a direct link between lab practices and actual or potential patient harm, and therefore directly to Balwani being the COO directly responsible for the lab practices, in my opinion anyway. So that was it for Bennett, and up next on the stand we had Dan Mosley. He testified in the Holmes trial, and you can see that testimony here. Mosley was an attorney for Cravath at the time and introduced a number of rich clients to Theranos and Holmes. As a result, the following investments were made in Theranos. The Walton family, heirs to the Walmart Inc. fortune and their associates, $150 million. The DeVos family, including former Trump Administration Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, $100 million. The Cox family, specifically the current and former chief executives of media and automotive conglomerate Cox Enterprises Incorporated, $100 million. Andreas Dracopoulos, Greek shipping heir and philanthropist, $25 million. Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State and one-time Theranos board member, $3 million. We heard that Mosley had actually found out about Theranos in the first place directly from Kissinger and he had in his own name personally invested about $6 million in the company. So that was it for the first part of the week. Let's see what the rest of Mosley's testimony brings and possibly we'll see the first patient in the second part of the week. If you've liked this series so far then please hit that like button and if you subscribe then hit the notification bell. You won't miss out on any future episodes. Bye for now.